The Third Intermediate Period, The Great Depression Take 3, 1070 BC to 525 BC. With Ramses XI, the New Kingdom came to a close. Egypt was plagued with droughts, disease, and the Nile was less than overflowing at the time, which caused this sustained lack. In addition, there was instability. Ramses XI was so weak that the priests of the cult of Amon ruled Upper Egypt pretty much, and Lower Egypt was ruled by a man named Hejhepre Setepenre Smendes, whom also founded the 21st dynasty. The beginning of the Third Intermediate Period has begun. What we will discuss in this video is the beginning of the end of Egypt being ruled under native Egyptians for any sustainable period. Now, Dynasty 22 and 23, a 200 year span, would be foreign rulers once again, mainly rulers from Libya. Another name for these dynasties is the Bubastite dynasties, and that is primarily due to the fact that they ruled out of a place called Bubastis in the Nile Delta region. Like previous rulers of Egypt, the Libyans built structures around the country, including Karnak, where pretty much all major pharaohs built, but they also had temples in the Nile Delta. However, they are badly damaged and maybe a few stones are left. The first of these Libyan kings was Shawshank I. Although a foreigner to Egypt, he still found it right to marry a woman of Egyptian royal blood so he could become king. He marries the daughter of a ruler from the previous dynasty. From what we can see, it wasn't a forced marriage in the sense that he just picked her out and forced to marry her. He was found to be a suitable husband for her because he was an accomplished warrior. Scholars think that this is so because his previous job was part of the mercenary army that Egypt employed from Libya. As you may recall, Egyptians fought with the Libyans in the past and some of the captured became employed by the crown of Egypt. In this case, he was head of the Libyan mercenary force. These forces were called the Meshwesh. So how exactly did he even get into the position to achieve pharaohship aside from marrying the right woman? As you may recall, Egypt was now divided and weak, and he simply exploited this and took Egypt over. I guess you could say that it was a kind of military coup d'etat. There were a lot of Meshwesh, and so they essentially took over from the inside. They weren't an invading force. This was festering in the background of Egyptian history for a while. This of course means what? They too became in some sense Egyptianized. This is why Shoshank I wanted a royal wife of Egyptian blood because he was sticking with tradition. If he wasn't Egyptianized, he would have just bulldozed and taken to the throne without courting Egyptian royals. But he didn't. As I said earlier in the course, Egypt's enemies hated them but loved their culture. The Libyans and the Egyptians, for that matter, portrayed Libyans as fairer skinned and often they had a feather in their hair. There was no doubt what you were looking at when you saw images of them on the walls, so they even looked different from the Egyptians. So we have Shawshank I in control of Egypt. Since Egypt is a vast place, he sends his sons to be governors of various parts of the land. His sons serve many different roles, not just as governors. There were also religious heads of the Temple of Amun. Shawshank I, in the spirit of the pharaohs before him and with his military background, of course, makes it his duty to go on various military campaigns. One of his first conquests is Canaan. This was in the 930s BC. It was around the time when King Solomon dies. We know this because even the Bible mentions it. In the Bible, he is known as Shishak. In 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 25 through 26, it says, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem. He carried off the treasures of the temple of the Lord and the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had made. Some archaeologists say that the Bible is unreliable in this story, but the image that you see now is Shoshank describing his conquest of the area. So this is one of the very few instances we see outside history corroborate biblical stories. However, it is interesting to note that the name for Jerusalem is not there on his wall. He just itemizes other names of places in Canaan and Megiddo. Perhaps the biblical story is not true after all. Or perhaps Shoshank used just border names for the territories and not the names of cities. Another interesting idea is that the king of Jerusalem, Jeroboam, essentially stopped Shoshank before he entered Jerusalem gave him the loot and so Shoshank never got to Jerusalem itself. His main goal was to loot. 
It is interesting to note that the passage from the Bible I just read states he took all the gold and wealth of Jerusalem, but there is no evidence he took the Ark of the Covenant, which is also worth a lot since it was made from precious metals. There are a few reasons that come to mind for me as to why this is, and I will tell you the one I think is correct. 1. There wasn't a true Ark of the Covenant. No real evidence suggests that there was one. The Bible is a self-referential text, and so you can't trust it 100%. 2. There was one, and it was hidden, so Shoshank didn't know it existed. 3. It may have left the country for Ethiopia. I say this because in Ethiopian Christianity, it was said that King Solomon gave the Ark to his son Menelik as a gift. Menelik being his son with Queen Sheba, the Queen of Ethiopia. 4. Or that he was bought off by King Jeroboam, as I mentioned a moment ago, and Shoshank simply bypassed Jerusalem. 5. Perhaps another reason. Now let me tell you why I think 4 could be the correct answer. If you read any of my other work, you may know that I quote heavily from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It's called the Septuagint. There is an interesting quote there about these events. But before I show you this, please note that in Greek, the name of the pharaoh Shawshank is Susakim. I will also prove that in a moment. It states in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 24, of the Septuagint edition only. This cannot be found in the standard Hebrew Bible or the English translations. And Susakim gave to Jeroboam Anno, the eldest sister of Thekemina, as his wife. She was great among the daughters of the king, and she bore to Jeroboam Abia, his son. And Jeroboam said to Susakim, Let me indeed go, and I will depart. So how do we know for sure that Susakim is Shoshank? There's a big clue found both in the Hebrew version and the Greek one. In the regular Hebrew-English translation of 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 40, it states, Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam fled to Egypt, to Shishak the king, and stayed there until Solomon's death. Okay, so we find here that Jeroboam flees to Shoshank for protection from Solomon. Notice what Jeroboam says to Susakim in the Septuagint, Let me indeed go, and I will depart. But even more than that, earlier in the Septuagint it states, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 22 through 23, And Solomon sought to kill him, and he was afraid and escaped to Susakim, king of Egypt, and was with him until Solomon died. And Jeroboam heard in Egypt that Solomon was dead, and he spoke in the ears of Susakim, king of Egypt, saying, Let me go, and I will depart into my land. Do you see? It's the same story, both in the Septuagint and the Orthodox Hebrew Bible, and this shows us that both Shishak and Susakim are indeed Shoshank. The only difference is, is that the Septuagint goes a step further and states that Jeroboam married an Egyptian queen. Remember when I said earlier in the course that kings would often marry foreign queens as a way to form alliances? So perhaps the Septuagint is correct, and Shoshank, aka Susakim, was simply building a new alliance with Jeroboam, knowing he would be king after Solomon's death, and the gold was given to Shoshank as a tribute. In return, he didn't ransack Jerusalem at all, and therefore didn't mention it in his conquest on the wall. This makes me think number four is correct. The Bible, of course, makes this story to be a negative one, but perhaps it wasn't in real life. After Canaan, he continued on north to Megiddo, the place where several pharaohs have fought, and from what we know, it was a successful campaign. When Shoshank I dies, his son Osorkan takes his place. He maintained many of his father's policies. It was a good time for Egypt. There is some evidence that he was very supportive of the religious temples and donated something like 485,000 pounds of silver, something crazy like that. That would be about $218 million as of the time of this recording, August 7, 2020. Could that be possible? Sure, but we need to remember that pharaohs did exaggerate their largesse as well. Osar Khan was to be succeeded by Shoshank II. But he dies and doesn't rule long, and his other brother, Tekalat I, becomes king. It was not a seamless transition. Some people challenged the legitimacy of Tekalat I, especially in Upper Egypt. In the end, not a lot is known about him. As this dynasty moves along, Egypt is doing better, but storm clouds are brewing. 
we find different factions in ancient Egypt vying for power. This brings the threat of civil war, but even more ominously is the growing resurgence of Nubia as a powerhouse in the region and it's taking place very quickly and it's pushing the Libyans out. The Nubians will be Dynasty 24. But before we discuss how they took over Egypt, I need to go back in time and explain why the Nubians or the Kushites were so resentful of Egypt and why taking Egypt over was the ultimate revenge. See you there.